I've got a thing that my screen keeps black. I need a new computer is what I need. All right. So do I. So do I. So do I. Well, welcome, everybody. It is noon on Wednesday, uh, June 12th, and it's the Zoe and Tim show. Um, so we're going to just sort of dive right in. Any questions you have or, or things that have come up yet, Zoe? Or? Nope, not so far. I was interested that the business of wine was written by John Moore Marco, or he's the new, I guess, editor in chief. And he came on board with Winebow when I was there many years ago. So it's neat. It's interesting to see him pop up in a periodical, you know? Yeah. And, and he actually goes way, way back to winery general management. And um, it, uh, actually, if you find him on LinkedIn or something, look at, look at his background. He's, he's an old, old, as a matter of fact, last time I saw him, I think, was in San Luis Obispo um, at a winery financial symposium, mm -hmm. but a really smart guy and uh, one of the good guys in the industry. So, all right. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Close out that. So, um, uh, we talked Monday about vineyards and really getting a really getting a sense of of a couple things. Number one, that that it is unto itself a business. Uh, it's agriculture. It's got all of the risks and requirements of getting into the agricultural business. Um, there are so many models. Uh, for owning your own vineyard, having somebody else manage it, having your own vineyard, you manage it. Um, there are wineries that lease vineyards and with a long-term lease can even uh, uh, call it estate fruit if, if they're managed, if, if they've got a long-term lease and managing the vineyard, those kind of things. Uh, and of course, more and more wineries are looking at how if I've got a certain amount of money to invest in my business, where am I going to put it? And how much do I want to have tied up in land and equipment and and then add to that the the distraction, if you will, um, how much time allocation and whose time is going to be allocated to running that vineyard uh, if if you do choose to own and operate your own. And then the final, piece of that being at what cost uh, at the end of the day trying to do it yourself uh, can often be much much more expensive than other options um, because your cost of the the equipment and and uh, and all those kind of things uh, really become quite high where where a modern vineyard management company uh, leverages economies of scale. So if they're planting lots of vineyards, you're going to buy X amount of stakes and wire and, and uh, irrigation stuff. A large vineyard company that's specializing in this will have uh, more buying clout uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, now what we're gonna do is transition from the, from the, the grapes and the, the two big pieces of it being the, the cost of the grapes that you're employing and the quality and consistency of, of the fruit that you're going to have, okay? So that's what you'll get when you watch Mondays. All right, so uh, cost of goods and who cares? When we play who cares in my classes, we're actually not, it's, it, it's not ambivalence or resignation, oh, who cares, but it's actually who does care. Um, so who cares about the cost of goods if you're a consumer and if you just love wine, you're, you know, relatively little you would care or, or maybe that any consumer cares of, of ultimately what the cost of goods 
uh, is. But certainly the producer uh, has a big stake in it. Uh, and the differential between the cost of goods to actually produce the finished case of wine and then what the winery sells the goods for, which is usually expressed as an FOB or an ex seller's price, right? That's, that's the profitability vector, if you will. And the other thing is a lot of people, oh, oh, I'm gonna sell direct to the consumer or I'm going to sell just in my state direct to account and have my own wholesale license. So actually, I've got a bigger profit because um, I've got my cost of goods and then I get the full amount that I, I resell it for. That is a trap. That is a lie. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> kidding. <laughs> Don't go there. Um, Trucks, delivery drivers. Exactly. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so, so in direct to account sales, which we'll talk about more in, in depth is that's when a producer holds an in-state uh, distribution license and you can sell to other licensed stores, restaurants, B&Bs, hotels, bars, that kind of stuff. And so in effect, you become the distributor. And, and with that, you've got all the inherent costs and risks and liabilities. Uh, there's a, a large wine company that just got stuck with a huge bill because it was directly servicing a cruise line and it was selling direct and the cruise line went out of business and and they were carrying a lot of uh, receivables that now uh, they're 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 probably just going to have to write that off and restaurants and bars uh, and to some extent hotels are notorious, notorious for slow payment and dragging their feet uh, and restaurants especially are notorious for going out of business. So anyways, um, so also in cost of goods, uh, again, the importer or exporter is going to care more about the FOB than the cost of goods per se. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that at that point of transaction is where the critical pricing takes place. And they're, they're interested that you're making money and that you've got a sustainable business, but they don't care as much about the pro cost of, of goods for production as their cost of goods as an importer or, or ex export company. Uh, and so forth down, down the line. So, Cost of goods can mean what's, what's your winery production cost for, for uh, finished cost of goods. And then as we go down the supply chain, the next step becomes the cost of goods that you establish as your FOB that a distributor would pay for it or a direct to account. And the best practice, if you do have a tasting room, no matter how tiny or, or whatever, that, that you actually at least have a transfer price of, of the winery FOB to the wine club, to the tasting room, whatever. So even if you're doing um, direct sales, it's important to, to have that accountability for, for the winery cost of goods and an FOB, even if you're just moving it 20 feet over to a, to a table that's your tasting room. Uh, you should account for that, okay? All right. So what goes into the cost of goods? Grapes that we discussed, uh, the production, aging, and cellaring, uh, the packaging, uh, all the corks, bottles, boxes, etc. Storage, a lot of people fail to account for storage and uh, it, it, it may be only 25 cents a case per month or something, or you might have your own storage facilities, but it needs to be accounted for and sometimes can really add up, especially if it's goods that you're going to hold for a period of time, uh, even maybe a couple of years before you're releasing. So it, storage is uh, greatly dependent on the type of wine and, and what you're producing. And then, of course, taxes and 
all that kind of stuff. Um, there's an important distinction, which is the cost of finished goods, and that's these kind of things. And you can see the kind of simplified stuff that 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 is you know generally available or typical. But the the only problem is they're showing a bottle of Harlan Estate here for twenty eight dollars. I don't think so. Um, and and so you know what's the difference between a a bottle of Moscato and something you're going to make quickly, turn over, no aging, get out of your winery versus a, a high end red wine. And as as we've already seen, you know they're saying an eight thousand dollar cost per ton that could easily be twenty thousand dollars, especially if it's something like Harlan, uh, or it could be five hundred dollars. So. So these the, the, these are nice, but really don't give you much insight of what goes into it. And then this is a little bit better uh, mm -hmm. uh, demonstration of, of of costs. Okay, all right. So again, we we always want to be critically thinking um, about perspective and point of view. Uh, Sales is going to be look, looking for certain things in pricing and being competitive in the market and that kind of stuff. The winemaker wants to run a profitable wine business, and and so uh, his his basis is the differential between the the fully allocated cost of of, of goods and the FOB price, and that that determines kind of the success of the winery. It allows you to allocate money back into um, improvements, new barrels, expansion, that kind of stuff. Oh, I know, I, I missed a thought here. <clears throat> the, the other really important thing, and we'll talk about this several times, you've got something called cost of finished goods. And that's really all the material and, and everything that, that goes into it from this standpoint. Uh, the most important number is the fully allocated cost of goods. And that means you've now put in it your overhead, your uh, facilities, your mortgages, your insurance, your uh, payrolls and whatever. So while, while cost of finished goods is, is, is an important number to know, uh, you also have to very carefully control the fully allocated cost of fit finished goods, uh, and that's adding adding all your your labor overhead, those kinds of things. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So as we're looking at it, we're at the producer level, uh, and then we're constantly going to be looking downstream, if you will, uh, at, at different. Uh, destinations, uh, different markets that you're going to, to be servicing or that the wine's destined for. And, and in effect, uh, production decisions also uh, have implications for how you're going to market the wine and, and how it's going to be positioned. Uh, number one selling Pinot Noir in the U.S., Ginozo? I don't. Mayomi. Of course. God. <laughs> and uh, the, the brilliance of the business model was uh, it's, it's the, the Wagner family from the Cana, Spain, uh, one of the kids. And they built the winery, they built the brand, uh, but no vineyards. And, yeah. And, and years ago, they were able to sell sell it for $325 million. And so they, they were able to, to create a huge value proposition. They, they source grapes from a lot of different places, which is imperative to keep the price as low as pro possible, keep the flavor profile, and, um, and they built that brand. Yeah. If, if you're producing a, a super high-end Pinot Noir from doesn't matter Willamette or Central Coast or Napa or Burgundy or whatever, 
you've got to look downstream at what are what are the market requirements for your production and um and that's also fuzzy too because uh, uh screaming eagle started as a um uh, being made in a custom crush facility uh there was no winery uh they, in effect, as we'll talk about, if you're a custom crush client, you, the, 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 um, the client in a custom crush agreement with, with a couple of kind of dicey exceptions right, right now, uh, the client actually is considered a wholesaler, not the producer. The producer of record is the winery that it's being produced at, not the client. And, um, just not to leave you hanging on the dicey part of it. People have been saying, oh, what if, what if I formed an LLC in partnership with the custom crush facility and then got my own basic permit to hang in there, then I could say, this is Zoe's winery, uh, bottled at Zoe's winery and so forth. But, but that's being contested right now by the TTB. So. So that's why it's kind of dicey. I like the birds. Oh, that's nice. Actually, I was going to mute you, but I I, I, I can I can mute myself. <laughs> I've also got rain falling on the roof. And oh, how nice! But we'll un unmute unmute you as needed. So, so what I want everybody to do: you've got a week to turn in a wine biz uh, project. Okay, I am really lax with late business or late, late work. Um, I'm more interested that you do the work. Uh, we don't have a lot of quizzes and so forth, but one of one of the uh, requirements of completing this course is to turn in your first wine biz sim uh, project. Um, and I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, those of you who are working at an advanced level or uh, who are making a wine or planning to make a wine, you can, you can do whatever you'd like. Uh, the program's already set up to um, uh, have all the numbers for a $25 red blend. So I want you to go in and change it up and play with some numbers and kind of see Number one, what are the variables that go, you know, so you, where can you reduce your costs? Where can you increase prices? Uh, there's, uh, what do you, there's a point at which you lose control. When you sell the wine to a distributor, you lose, it's out of your hands. So you may have all sorts of ideas of what it, what's going to happen in the market. But once you've, you've actually sold it, and delivered it to a distributor, they're now in ownership and they're in control of what they're going to do. And so um, uh, not knowing this can have an impact because some people think, oh, that's great. Here, I've done the price workup. I met with the distributor. You know, we're gonna sell this wine for $19.99 or $29.99 or whatever it is. And then you actually find out they decide they're gonna take a bigger markup at their end and you're not, in the price position that you were hoping for in that market. And then you go in and ask them, hey, where, you know, how can we get it down? Oh, well, um, there's a thing called billbacks. <laughs> and that is, write me a check and, and then we'll reduce the price. You know, it's like, wait, wait a minute, did we negotiate this? Well, they own the goods now and uh, so forth. So that's important to know. And then we used to do an unoaked uh, Chardonnay demo. I, I mentioned this in the Wednesday class. Go around and look at uh, uh, what the unoaked wines, uh, Chardonnays are in the market. See if you can find the most expensive one you can find. Post it on the Facebook page, take a picture. And, and just, just know that if you're making 100,000 cases of Chardonnay and you can eliminate the oak, you can make millions more in in uh in profit okay so anyways uh uh very important things to look at all right and of course
course, we always go, go through this form. All right, so what I'm going to do now is uh, go on over to the, um, the Wine Biz Sim. And have you gotten a chance to play with this at all, Zoe? Not yet. So uh, just a real quick thing. Remember, uh, in our current system, uh, your work is not saved on your computer. It's saved on a URL. So when I go in and I, and I call this uh, uh, Zoe's Vineyard, the state red blend okay with you? Or, uh, actually, let, let's, I'm gonna unmute you a second, hang on. You need to un, um, what kind of red wine you wanna make, Zoe? Let's do Italian varietals. Okay. My wheelhouse. And you wanna do one or you wanna do like a super Tuscan model or what would, Nebbiolo? Sure, I'd, low, I'd love to do like a low end and a, I'm good. So, so you want to do a, a, a low end super Tuscan or a low end blend? How about fourteen ninety nine red blend? Okay, great. And then you would put your date in. Now, remember when you start a new book? Um, what is today? Uh, you want to hit save, and when I hit save, it's going to give me a new URL. And now I need to bookmark the project. Right. right. So you go up to your bookmark. It's going to give you this name, but I want I I would want to call it Zoe's Red Blend. And then it'll um, you can save it up up in the top. If you make a lot of these, if if you have fun with it, you get a year's license to this, and you'll get the new system when it comes up. Um, but anyways, when you want to go back to your project, you go back to the bookmark. If you're going to work on another computer, save your URL, send it as a message, or note it somehow, because on the other computer, this is where you'll go to get back to your workbook. That makes sense? Okay, and then, um, and then if you ever come up with, it's not letting me input things, that's because I saved it, now I need to hit edit again. All right. And from this point on, it'll auto save things for me too, so it makes it really, really neat. All right. It's gonna take just a second, there we are. So you put your name in it and so forth. Now, we have built into this system and you can actually go go look at it on the last page. We've got a a price workup so that you can do an estimate. If this is your FOB, then this would be your actual selling price. So here's the FOB. Here's the selling price. So if we want to get what did we say, fourteen ninety nine? Uh oh. Here we go. We're going to have an FOB of uh, 67 bucks. Does that make sense? And what this is, is that's your winery selling price. So that's what the numbers in your profit, and in this case, your, your loss is going to be based on. Um, and then it'll give you all those numbers. Now what we get to do is go to the great costs and make some adjustments. Um, so what, what do we want as our number one great variety? Um, Sangiovese? Sure. Why not? Makes sense. And then what do we want to blend in there? Merlot, Cabernet, Syrah. How about some Merlot? Some Merlot, we'll do that. And then what Little else? Cab. Huh? Little cab. Cabernet always helps sell it. Yep. Cabernet Sauvignon. And you, you, so, and you can put in as many or few as you want. And if, if, if you want to do something that's not here, you can put your own. Uh, if you're doing a Pinot Noir, let's say from a blend of three different vineyards or 
you're doing even a single vineyard, but you've got different blocks that are different yields and in different prices. You you can configure this anyway and then put any notes that you might want to put in here. So now that we've gone to 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 San Giovese, you, you can see uh, we can in all likelihood, what kind of AVA are we going to have for this? Is this going to be a California wine? How about you just call it, um, how about just DOC, how about something from Umbria? Well, we can do that, but you're going to have to do conversions into Lira, and it's really hard. So let's do a California project. Okay. But uh, we... Uh, anybody who does need to do international, uh, basically, you do your price conversions or you can uh, actually put it in in terms of, of, of uh, a cost. I'm sorry, the best way to do it, you would have to figure out what is the cost in Umbria per ton of your San Giovese in Lira, then convert that to dollars. Does that make sense? And it's not all that hard to do. And then, uh, so let, let's just say that that we're going to look at getting our fruit for 1200 bucks a ton. And uh, what percentage of each of these wines do you want, do you want to go with? Well, it looks like uh, probably a little bit more Merlot if, if uh, it's cheaper. All right. So let's say that we found Merlot for 900 and, and this, this is, this is actually how blending is done, you guys. <laughs> all right. And, it's a and cost calculation. Uh, a week from today, you guys are all, all actually going to get to blend your own wine. You're going to be able to go out and buy wine. I'll give you conversion prices. And instead of the little soup song of this, you know, blah, 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 um, you're actually going to have to say, well, oh crap, this stuff's five bucks a gallon and this is 35 bucks a gallon. What's the best wine I could make that's leveraging the most of? So, so let's say that we're going with 60% Merlot. Let's go ahead and knock this down to, um, to let's say, 25%. All right. And that's going to leave us 15% for the Cabernet. And let, let's say that we were able to get the Cabernet for some somewhere in the in between or let's say it was a little more expensive 1400 okay all right so there you go so what what you're going to get is your total cost per ton of the grades averages at this blend uh 1050 per ton uh we just were able to um salvage 40 grand of of margin so we're still losing on this proposition. And what would you say you would, you would have to look at in terms of number of cases that we're gonna produce of this? Is this gonna be feasible for 3,000 cases to make 1999? And I'm not saying it is or isn't, but you could also try it at 10,000 cases, all right? And um, play with, with different production numbers as, as we go. Does that make sense? All right, so we've got a 10,000 cases of $67 FOB, and um, this is our Red Tuscan blend. We've got our grape costs in there. You might be able to say, you know what, we're going to need to really look at some of this pricing can we get our sangiovese for a thousand dollars you know and then if we go back up we're losing less now let me go back to the original three thousand just for point of reference okay all right great so so again this this is how you noodle around and, and figure out your costs on the grapes all right, now we're going to go to the production. And production, um, uh, we're doing 100% uh, uh, full production. If you wanted, you can also go out and buy some bulk wine. Uh, so the way that might work is if you were to put 80% in here, 
Oops, I'm sorry. We're gonna, it's gonna do it for us. We're gonna put 20% in here. And uh, the space for, for your bulk line is down here. And let's say that you were able to get bulk line at, at 20 bucks or 20 bucks a gallon. So you can also run different scenarios, seeing what's on the market in bulk wine and, and this and that. But you notice if we were to be able to find some bulk wine to, to throw in there, we just saved ourselves another uh, uh, 20 grand or so. Okay. Um, any additional pre-fermentation handling and treatments and so forth. The, the big number to look at here is what is your cost of production per ton? And this is excluding aging and cellaring. So if you're working with a custom crush facility, they'll give you a number. And it might be $260, it might be $1,500. If you are a producing winery, you want to work with your accountant to say, okay, if we take our cost of winemaking for all of our wine, divided by the number of cases, what is that number? Does that make sense? So this is applied per ton, excluding aging and cellaring. And let's say that we were able to, you know, we've got, uh, here's our, our, our needs for, for grape tonnage. We need um, 40 tons. So if we're able to knock that down a couple hundred bucks and hit enter, then again, we're, we're having a, a pretty strong saving, but the interesting thing is the savings, not really huge, okay? And the other thing, as we talk about uh, a week from today, when we talk about bulk wines, custom crush, and so forth, um, the price that you get for production from a custom crush facility might be like an a la carte menu. You bought the New York strip steak for $40, but you get your bill and they added four or six dollars for the potato, another buck for the sour cream, you know, a buck for the chives. Oh, you wanted this and this and this. So, so the other, th that's why we also have these additional fields. You might be making a wine that, that, you know, $600, your average processing uh, expense, but you're going to uh, do something uh, prior to making the wine, that's an addition prior to fermentation to chill the grapes or or uh, uh, do extra culling and so forth. There might be expenses before or after in addition to um, the basic fee. Does that make sense? All right. Then uh, this is going to give us the final cost, the cost of the bulk wine total, and then we've got our state and federal excise taxes. Uh, we've put in a buck seven per gallon, and uh, uh, all you have to do if you want to see more about wonderful taxes is click on that, and here they is. <laughs> so based on, on, on wine gallons, uh, the tax class, by alcohol and, and so forth, and with and without CO2, et cetera, okay? All right, so that gets us to a cost of finished wine. So going through these processes, we've now crushed our grapes. You can also go up here. Uh, one of the numbers that I use 60 cases per ton as sort of a, a rough equivalence, but, uh, a lot of wines, uh, especially higher end, might be only 50 tons per case. Uh, you could probably squeeze maybe three more tons. Ooh, we're getting closer to profitability. Okay, that makes sense. So these are the kind of numbers to play with. And, and as you're playing with these numbers, look and see what it's doing to our gross margin per case in our total. All right, so then we're gonna go into the barrel room. And this is a wild mess that um, uh, you need to put in certain inputs for it to be working, and we've sort of flagged those out. Uh, but in this case, this is pre-filled for 50% of the wine going into 
a uh, in the barrel for six months, uh, and uh, that's new barrels, and then six months in. Um, let me see if yeah, six months in uh, a combination of oak. All right. And adding that six months in the combination, our gross margin now we're back back in the hole. That that lost us uh, about twelve thousand dollars just just to add that six months. So what we could do is we could say, I think we would agree we're not going to put a fourteen ninety nine into new French oak. Would you agree on that? So, right. So. Let's see if we can get. So right now we're at minus thirty. We're we're losing about thirty-two grand. If we take it out of the new French oak and just put zero percent there, and then go over here and put a hundred percent. All right. How how do you know what program two is? How do you know that's you? You get to name it. Oh, okay. So you label so, that. Okay. So so you can label this new oak or. American oak or this or this. So you can have, and any single wine could have all sorts of combinations and that's why we kind of set it up this way. All right. And you can just do stainless and leave it all at zero, right? Correct. Which we'll get to in just a second. So, so we're now losing about four grand just by, by changing the oak program, all right? And so this shouldn't have any effect here. Yeah, so that's gonna be zero now. And, and we've got 100% in used French oak. Um, and here are the key considerations in barrel economies. What's your lading cost of the barrel and what's the salvage cost of the barrel? Right. So a lot of people just take the cost of a barrel. Okay, it's 25 cases divided. It's, it's simple math, but doesn't give you any clue on what the real cost is. And so it, it may be that your new barrel costs $1,300, or if you've got a, it might be $1,500 from some producers. It might be much less than that. If it's American oak, it'll be a few hundred dollars less. But if it's new, you can only use it as new one year. And are you going to sell it or are you going to transfer it over to your used program? Does that make sense? Um, after the used program, what are you going to do with it? Uh, you've got enough planters around your house in the winery now. Uh, in Napa, the, um, the Boy Scouts uh, in, in the Napa Valley actually have a used barrel program. They buy and sell or... And, and you donate to them and then they sell them. So if you're ever needing a few extra barrels and, and, and whatever, you call the Boy Scouts. And uh, yeah, I know it's really cool. And, and it gives the money back to the community as well. So uh, how many years are you going to use the barrel? So if we actually just said, you know what, we're gonna take care of our barrels and whatever, we're gonna use it for eight years and enter that and again, uh, that saved us a couple of grand. Okay. Um, evaporation. Question, question yeah. on um, sort of barrel aging and icing. So if someone says it's aged in neutral oak, how, how old would you consider that barrel to be? Um, or is it just the toast level? Well, no, it's, it's, it, it's the number of uses. Uh, it, it, and why... It, it's like a tea bag, you know, the first use you get more color, you get lots of flavor in this, second use it's in it. So uh, generally after about three or four uses, it starts to get pretty neutral. So there's no technical definition. And a lot of times also when people say in neutral oak, doesn't mean that it's in, in uh, uh, 58 or 60 gallons. It could be large barrels. So so that's another thing is because you get to say, okay, we're going to do this in, in uh, a, a, a different size. We're going to do this in 120 gallon barrels. 
that's going to greatly reduce the number of barrels you're using and the labors and whatever. Notice just that got us into the black. So we're making money now. So, uh, so these are really important distinctions that a lot of people just don't really think of when they go into a cellar and they see these beautiful large barrels. Most people don't know that in Tuscany, uh, the number, what was the number, historically, what's the, 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 the type of wood that's traditionally used in the Rhone in like Chateauneuf du Pop and so forth and in Tuscany? And it's chestnut. And they were usually big, big containers. Yeah. And then keeping the ambient temperature, humidity, and the controlled environment. Uh, there are people who lose 10% evaporation a year because they don't pay attention to this. You should shoot for 3%. You've got to pay for topping it up and replacing that wine. And it can be a huge amount of money sometimes. <clears throat> so right now we're making 850 bucks. And don't forget, we want to tell a story all the way. So our aged in uh, French oak uh, export barrels, 120 gallon, you know, etc. So what's the story that you're building? What's the marketing? And is, is that towards the market and what they want to be hearing. And if I can, so right now we're making um, uh, 900 bucks, 850 bucks, ain't much. Uh, if we were to reduce our, our evaporation rate by 2%, right, uh, we should be, you know, we're, we're making over a thousand bucks just from doing that. So. Make sense? How do you reduce your evaporation rate? Uh, more humidity. In, in the cellar. In the cellar and actually larger barrel because you're reducing the surface area to volume. So we, in effect, we could say we're gonna use larger barrels and this and that. But today also people want kind of a, this nice oak profile, right? It's very popular. So what if we said, well, you know what? We're just gonna do this with 50% of the wine. And then we'll get to what we can do on the next page. And, and again, we continue to, to improve our profitability as we go through this, all right? So now we're going to go to the, um, the cellar and storage. And so now we got 50% of our wine and stainless steel. We got 50% for six months in these barrels. You know, oak chips are pretty cheap. <laughs> Technology is pretty good. And I guarantee you're all drinking wines now with oak chips, oak adjuncts, sawdust, and etc., and not knowing it, uh, the science has become really, really good. And different environments, micro-oxygenation in combination with this and that. And so what we could do is uh, we could just have standard storing and so forth, but maybe we want to invest 500 bucks in oak chips and micro oxygenation and maybe it's 500 for that and maybe it's 120 bucks or or something to, to do the micro oxygenation okay we're pinging a little bit down here but it's not nearly what we were getting slammed for in the oak aging and we're going to get much more of an impact of profile and this is where the artistry the value proposition, the quality meets the, the, your bottom line, the winemaker bonuses, the, the overhead, uh, ability to reinvest, uh, ability to go to, to, to um, uh, Belize for every winter. Um, any additional treatment, stabilization, clarification, and so forth, 
how much are you going to uh, store, how many months are you going to store the, the goods before they're released? Uh, this is something that's, that's one of those a la carte killers where everybody says, oh, I'll have a baked potato too. And it's $8 for the baked potato. And, and all of a sudden you're wondering why you've got, you know, another 32 bucks on, on your bill at the end. It's called in and out fees. So you decide you're going to use a temperature controlled warehouse. They've got the right conditions. You're, it's going to make your evaporation rates, but they're, they're, they're charging you for every case you move in and out. Uh, let's say that, that you've got two times and they charge 50 cents. All right. And so that's going to start pinging you as well. For the number of months that that you've got 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 that going on okay all right packaging and bottling uh, this is research for you all and i'm going to go through this pretty quickly bottles uh, or cans or you know pet containers whatever it is uh, what's your closure corkscrew caps uh, uh, is a capsule required or some sort of uh, pilfer proof? You know, if you've got screw caps, it's usually already handled. If you've got cork, you need a uh, typically either beeswax or something pilfer proofing it or a capsule. What's your cost of labels, uh, boxes, and graphics? Now, usually when you buy your bottles, it includes the cost of the cardboard, but a lot of people like to have their their boxes look really nice and colorful to stand out in a warehouse to make nice displays and so forth. So uh, uh, th this can be a little or it could be a lot of an additional fee. All right, then you need to get your cert uh, certificate of label approval and maybe you had extra artwork that was done, anything that's packaging related that would be specific just to this run of wine. Uh, whether you're doing the bottling, one of the, the greatest things ever conceived was mobile bottling units because the bottling line is the biggest pain in the ass, the greatest source of breakdowns. Um, and, and you, you know, you've got your entire crew waiting there. The wine's going in the bottle. It's kind of susceptible also because you're moving the wine and then one little part gives out and, and everybody's sitting there for hours or maybe even a day or worse while you're waiting for the bottling line to get fixed. So, um, uh, but you, you will have a cost or if you're using a mobile bottling or sending the wine to a bottling facility, they give you the, 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 the cost per case. Um, and let's say that, that we're able to negotiate that down to, to 250 a case, right? Um, Let's say that we're able to, to go out. You can actually buy bottles uh, in, in salvage. There are people who buy and sell. You say, I need 3,000 cases of a leaf green Bordeaux style, this and that, and I can get it for a buck, a buck 10 a case. Uh, and, you know, we're going to work to get our label costs down and, and those kind of things. Uh, we're going to get our... Uh, changeover fee is, is, let's say we wanted our red blend bottled, and then we're going to uh, change that over to Sauvignon Blanc or our Albarino or whatever. There will be a changeover fee, etc. So this gives you a really, really good idea what goes into it. And we're, we're making almost 16 grand now. <laughs> All right. So then we get to our FOB cost and breakdown, and this will. Uh, give you, instead of what we were showing on the slideshow, this little generic thing, this is actually what went into this wine as a percentage of the total, dollars per case, and then gives us our margin. So we can go back, we can tweak things, we can uh, move them around a little bit more to optimize our, our production profitability, and uh, uh, you know, say, okay, you know, we've, we've really got to get these, these great costs in line. Uh, 
uh, we we need to pay nine hundred dollars and do everything we can to negotiate that. Uh, we really got to look for some Cabernet at, at eleven hundred dollars a ton. So you can go back in, and now we're making twenty grand. Uh, if we really want to make a lot more, we go back to the very beginning and say, you know what? Maybe this isn't a very re realistic FOB. Let's bump it up. And as we do so. Here's our bottom line at 22,000. So if we went up a dollar a bottle, a significant, almost doubling our gross margin. Does that make sense? Yes, so that 37,000 is a gross margin to the winery according based, to the new FOB. Okay. That that's correct. Based on all our production inputs at a $73 FOB. Now we're a little later, we're going to show you a much more refined cost calculator. All right. So that you'll actually be able to say, well, you know, we're going to sell it for this, but we're, we're going to have more negotiations. I've got a great distributor or, you know, we've got different plans. Uh, so the way that this cost breakdown is FOBs, the winery selling price uh, from what you input and then with a distributor landed cost and selling price with an estimated shelf price at a 25% margin. Does that make sense? So this gives you just, you can review that to, to see what we've done. And if you want to see how we're doing it, you can actually change those inputs if you want. But um, I, I don't suggest going there yet. Okay. All right. So let me go back then to our presentation. That's what I, I want you guys to I don't care what form this is when you hand it in. You can you can zero everything out and make two hundred cases of a of a two hundred dollar bottle of wine. Uh, if anybody really, really wants something that, that is eye popping, make 10 buck or two buck chuck. See if you can estimate how many cases they produce of that wine. And a little note when you go into Whole Foods, they've got the same exact wine under another label. When you go into ABC stores in Florida, they got the same wine under another label. They're producing millions and millions of cases. You can't even buy your bottles and boxes for 24 bucks. That's what their FOB is for the wine. How the hell do you do that? So, so all, and have a respect for, for inexpensive wine. There's so much bashing going on. These wine clubs, zero carb, zero sugar, all the other wines are poison. Um, there's this horrible thing uh, in vine pear. Uh, about what's in your your two buck chuck, and it's frogs and 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 workers and that go that end up in the bin and whatever. Jesus, what? Sometimes I wonder what our industry is thinking. Okay, so what we're also going to start looking at is wine production models. This is what we're going to talk about a lot on Monday. A traditional or a state model is you own the vineyard, you own the winery, you produce it, you bottle it, you sell it. You're a wine estate. You could have the winery only, but no vineyards. And there are high-end wineries, and there's Mayomi, and there's a lot of wineries that do this. Alternating proprietorship is where there's a co-op, if you will, that then allows different people to hang their own basic federal permit for production, and everybody sharing the equipment. When these things work well, they are absolutely unbelievable. When, when they don't work well, they are a nightmare. Um, and there are more and more purposefully built alternating proprietorship facilities that some people will now build and then lease for other people to come in and hang their license and use. Custom Crush, a client goes to a licensed winery, says, I want you to make wines to these specifications. The client is, carries a wholesaler's permit. You are not a producer. You are not noted as a producer. 
and you may even be growing your own grapes, but you have to sell them to the Custom Crush facility, or you source the grapes and the Custom Crush facility has to buy them, you'll, you'll provide the money up front and so forth. But a Custom Crush is the winery of record holding the basic permit is the producer, not the client. Bulk wine is wine that's been made. We'll talk about this. I'll send you the current inventory of all the bulk wine in Australia so you can go. And, uh, and it's a wild, wild business. Uh, I've got a conference coming up. I'll be uh, uh, doing, doing a class from at the end of July. Shiners is the business of buying and training finished wine in the bottle that has a generic cork or screw cap or, or whatever closure, but no label on it. So the bottle is shiny. You can buy the product. Do not think, do not think that bulk wine or shiners means cheap wine. There are some incredible wines that are bought and sold and traded. Inventories of bulk wines from used to be from Chateau Latour and Lafitte Rothschild. Now they do second labels. So they're actually vertically integrating what they used to sell off. But um, uh, high-end wines in, in these categories is a very vibrant business. You can go to winebusiness.com classifieds. And in the classifieds, you, you've got to pull down to select either bulk wines or shiners. Okay, so we've got traditional, and this is some more information about a, what is a bonded wine premise, uh, a bonded winery, or a bonded wine cellar. Um, of course, we talked about the, that, a little bit more about alternating proprietors, custom crush, and of course, bulk wines. And bulk wines next Wednesday, you'll get to do your own, okay? So if, 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 if y'all haven't been to the TTB Gov site, go there. Uh, uh, unbelievable amount of information and details, even even how to start a business, you know, what, you know, are you going to be an S Corp, an LLC, a partnership, these kind of things. Uh, do your homework. I want to see some pictures that you guys are taking in stores and restaurants and tasting rooms and wineries and whatever. And let's hear from you all on the discussion forum. Okay. Wow. I'm almost on time. Zoe, any questions? Um, no, it's good. All right. Fantastic. Well, I'll send this out. Uh, uh, anybody having any troubles getting into the wine biz sim to the financial workbook, just let me know. If you lose your work, don't panic. If, if you've saved, if you've named it and saved it, I can find it and, and get you back on. Uh, if you didn't name and save it, you didn't name and save it. Okay. Great. Thanks for being in the class. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.